Well, welcome everybody. And again, thank you all so very much for coming tonight. My name is Lynn Smith. I'm a volunteer with the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association. And you'll see some of us around and about in this area that have our yellow ribbons on. We believe that everybody deserves to live in a beautiful and vibrant neighborhood. And that's what we do. We work every day. We have regular meetings where we talk about issues and talk them through. But then we do more than that. We take actions. We share community. Some of you may have enjoyed our holiday history lantern walk, where the youngsters make their own lanterns, and then we walk to various historic places in Brockton. Some of you might have enjoyed our little free libraries that are scattered throughout Brockton. They're little book bags or little boxes on the corners. It's a very simple concept. Take one, leave one. So as you're walking by, you get to have a surprise on what's in the little free library. Marcus Garvey once said that a people without the knowledge of their past history, origins, and culture is like a tree without roots. FDNA believes that from that knowledge grows empathy because of our shared experiences, and from empathy comes the desire to take action to create what Dr. King calls a beloved community. So tonight, in the bicentennial year of his birth, we honor Frederick Douglass. Surrounded by this amazing diversity, which is Brockton, we honor our shared history. You know, Frederick Douglass was born in 1818. We don't know the exact date, but he himself chose February 14th because he said his mother called him my little Valentine. What we do know is Mr. Douglass is one of America's most important thinkers, writers, speakers, and civil rights activists. And for Brockton, he connects our cultures with many threads. Tonight is a celebration of that connection, that cultural quilt, and we hope tonight's program instills an understanding of how our past shapes our present and our future. You know, it takes a lot of people to make an event like this come together. So first of all, we'd like to thank the city of Brockton and the mayor's office for allowing us the use of this magnificent building. Then we'd like to thank all the FDNA volunteers who worked on this event and who are already hard at work at our other events. July 1st, thanks to a grant from Mass Humanities, we read Douglas's speech as a community, what is the 4th of July to the slave? But we do it a little differently in Brockton. We have volunteers who pick a paragraph and speak it in the language of their ancestors. So last year we had a paragraph in Gaelic, Greek, Mandarin Chinese, Haitian Creole, Cape Verdean Creole, Italian, Lithuanian. So we want to add more languages this year to show our diversity. And then, of course, you know on August 19th, we have our ice cream Sunday social in the garden. So this year, to honor Mr. Douglas, we thought we'd add a little birthday cake um, as well. We want to thank all of the elected officials that have joined us tonight. And we want you to know that your service is appreciated by all of us. You couldn't do a program that without sponsors. And so we have a number of our sponsors here. I see Mary Waldron and Just Checking In. Thank you so much, Just Checking In, for your sponsorship. Is Brockton Housing Authority in the house? Brockton Housing Authority is one of our sponsors. Thank you so much for that. Eastern Bank Foundation, um, Harbor One Bank, State Representative Jerry Cassidy, who's up on the stage with us. State Representative Claire Cronin, Rockland Trust, and the ladies of AKA Psi o Iota Omega helped with the refreshments. So now I want you to give them all a hand and say thank you. So now to set the stage, I'm going to bring up our historian, our teacher, our mentor, and someone I think you all know who's going to set the stage for our evening, Willie A. Wilson, Jr. Thank you. Um, I've been asked to set the stage for this evening, and I'm so pleased that we have Mr. Pace again. 
but I, I want you to uh, just take a, a time travel trip to what was then High Street, where the Liberty Tree is located. And uh, we know that Frederick Douglass visited North Bridgewater three to four times, but unfortunately, we're still doing research. The, it predates the Brockton Enterprise. The paper that was used in town was the North Bridgewater Gazette. And so we're still looking uh, via the Mass Historical Society, uh, the Boston Athenaeum, for actual papers that might have been copied in microfilm. But uh, what you need to realize that he had, he had a deep love and affinity for the town of North Bridgewater as well as Abington. So he was a friend of who we call Edward Eels Bennett. Many of you know of him. He was the gentleman that had the stables on High Street, which is now Frederick Douglass Avenue. And his stables was uh, actually one of the stops of the Underground Railroad. And so Mr. Bennett was a painter. Um, he was very loved here in the North Bridgewater community. Many African-American uh, churches and, and organizations actually named groups and orders after him. Uh, Lincoln and Lincoln Congregational Church and Messiah Baptist Church were, were both founded in 1897. Uh, even for years up until the 20s and 30s, always spoke of Mr. Bennett. We do have descendants of the Bennett family that still live in the area. And so within that frame of reference, I want you to think of North Bridgewater. Before it was called North Bridgewater, it was called North Parish. Before that, it was North Precinct. And uh, before that, it was called Setucket by the Wampanoag Indians. And in 1894, they went from the name, the town of North Bridgewater, to Brockton. And in 1881, we were incorporated as a city. And so it's on that note that I'd like to introduce to you the mayor of the city of Brockton, Mr. Bill Carpenter. Well, good evening, everyone. It's, it's certainly a pleasure to be uh, here with everyone to enjoy tonight's program. Uh, looking forward to Mr. Pace's performance. I think that uh, it, this being the bicentennial year, bicentennial celebration of the life of Frederick Douglass, uh, I appreciate so much the work that Lynn and the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association have done and the sponsors so that Brockton could be a, one of those cities across the country where uh, Frederick Douglass spent some time during his life and, and made an impact. And as uh, Willie mentioned, it's just a short walk from here to where the Liberty Tree stood and many abolitionists, including uh, Frederick Douglass, spoke. Um, I think that as we'll see in tonight's performance, there are so many direct ties and connections between the life and the work of Frederick Douglass and the city of Brockton, and, and obviously the connections with Haiti and Cape Verde and Ireland, uh, but I think even much more so um, the, his role as an abolitionist, but also a, not just a champion of equal rights, but a champion of women's rights, you know, a mind that was at least a century probably ahead of his time. Uh, and so for a couple personal notes for me, and, and we know he, his role in, in the Civil War and advising Lincoln and, and recruiting African Americans to fight for the Union and that connection with North Bridgewater and the Massachusetts 54th. Um, but for myself, there are just really two personal connections that really mean a lot to me. Uh, one is, his unique relationship with the Irish uh, because he had actually traveled uh, extensively in Ireland and England and was in Ireland at the time of the potato famine. Uh, it was actually money raised by the Irish and English that he used to buy his freedom when he came back to the United States. Um, but that he witnessed firsthand the suffering of the Irish during the famine and made a correlation between the suffering of the Irish in the famine and the suffering of African Americans here in America, and actually traveled back to the United States with many Irish immigrants who were escaping the potato famine and, and coming to the United States. So that, that piece has always uh, personally meant uh, a lot to me as a person of predominantly Irish heritage. Uh, and I think nowadays in this, this role as mayor and, and working with our city, um, when I look at the, the whole life of Frederick Douglass, I think about his vision for 
his vision for what the community and, and the country should look like and his vision of a, of a diverse community of all different types of people who all had equal rights and, and lived together. And that was his vision back in the 1800s and it's a vision that we're still striving to achieve here in Brockton today, but it's a vision that we believe in, and I believe in the 21st century, Brockton will become in many ways the community that Frederick Douglass envisioned back in the 1800s. So uh, I am looking forward uh, very much to Mr. Pace's performance and the discussion afterwards, and I appreciate so much everyone that made this possible. Thank you. So I'll do a little housekeeping. Some of you might not know the story of Frederick Douglass, so we have five people on the stage who are each going to read a personal account that connects them to Frederick Douglass, and maybe you'll hear something in, in them about your history that will connect you to Frederick Douglass as well. Then Mr. Pace will come out as Frederick Douglass, and he'll do a talk to you. And then at the end of the talk, he'll break out of character, and we'll have questions and answers from the audience. So please be ready with any of your questions to ask Mr. Pace. And then, after all that hard work, we invite you to stay for a little reception uh, in the back hall. We have pastries, and we have some water, and Ocean Spray is one of our sponsors, and I have enough cranberry juice to last my lifetime. Uh, so I brought those as well. So that is the, the housekeeping. You know the restrooms are in the back as well. I always ask people to check the exits just because we need to be cognizant of where the exits are as well. So we're going to start backwards in Mr. Douglas's life. We're going to sort of start at the end and work our way back towards the beginning of his life. So our first presenter is Eleanor Wentworth, and I think you'll recognize what she's going to talk about. Ellie. Frederick Douglass died on February 20th, 1895, at age 78. That very day, Mr. Douglass attended a meeting of the National Council of Wet Women in Washington, D.C. During that meeting, he was brought to the platform and given a standing ovation by the audience. Forty-seven years earlier, 300 women had gathered in Seneca Falls, New York, for the very first Women's Rights Convention. Mr. Douglas was one of only 40 men who attended. In an editorial published that same year, 1848, in his newspaper, The North Star, Douglas wrote, in respect to political rights, there can be no reason in the world for denying to woman the elective franchise. Susan B. Anthony played an important role in the women's suffrage movement. She spoke out for equal rights for women all over the United States and at our own Liberty Tree on Frederick Douglass Avenue here in Brockton. Mr. Douglass and Miss Anthony had a lifelong friendship, but it was not always an easy one. Miss Anthony fought for universal suffrage and did not agree that the black man should receive the right to vote before woman did. She said, men, their rights and nothing more. Woman, their rights and nothing less. Susan B. Anthony died March 13, 1906, at the age of 86 in Rochester, New York. After Miss Anthony's death, a phrase from her last suffrage speech Failure is impossible, became the motto of young suffragettes. Woman finally obtained the right to vote 19 years later after her death through the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, the 19th Amendment in 1920. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jean Bradley de Renan Court. I am a Brocktonian, a Haitian American, in a Brockton City Council at large. Frederick Douglass served as the minister to Haiti from 1889 to 1891. Mr. Douglass was a great admirer of Toussaint Louverture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution, the only slave revolt, which resulted 
in the establishment of a nation. In 1793, Louvetu, who at the age of 50, had spent 30 years of his life in slavery, was in the ranks of the African, um, African slave of the French colony of Saint-Domingue, now Haiti, as a fierce abolitionist, a brilliant military strategist, and a statesman. For about 10 years, using knowledge acquired from history books and learning from European military strategists, Louverture, his self-adopted name means the opening. Pursue re relentless military and guerrilla war against the Spanish, the British, and the French armies systematically dismantled the slave structure that kept more than 500,000 African, Amer African in bondage. In a preface to a, bio to a biography of literature by Victor Schultzscher that unfortunately was never published, Mr. Douglas wrote, the world, Christian world was at that time against literature. England, France, Spain, Portugal, the United States, and the whole end were all slaveholders. They could only look with awe upon a great Negro leading his class in rebellion for its freedom. Louverture has character, his valor, his wisdom, and his unflinching fidelity to the cause of liberty are the inheritance of which his people should be proud of. Good evening, my name is Stephen Abrams, United States Army retired, I am an African American. February 1863, during the Civil War, Frederick Douglass became a recruiter for the 54th Regiment the first organized regiment of African-American soldiers. His son, Lewis and Charles, joined this regiment. Eventually, 180,000 Africans became service members in the Civil War on the Union side. Lewis, the son, born in New Bedford, served as the first Sergeant Major of the 54th Regiment. In July of 1863, he was in the thick of the battle at Fort Wagner, where 1,515 Union troops were mowed down by a blistering barrage from the Confederate stronghold. Lewis could not believe that he returned home unharmed from the assault. If you've seen the movie Glory, where Denzel Washington portrayed, you know of the battle. In August of 1863, Mr. Douglas met with President Lincoln to discuss the unequal pay that black Civil War soldiers received. The United States Army paid the black soldiers $10 a week, minus a clothing allowance, and the white soldiers got $3 more, plus a clothing allowance. Mr. Douglas met with President Lincoln and Congress passed a bill authorizing equal pay for the black and white soldiers in 1864. My name is Jerry Cassidy. I am the state representative who serves many neighborhoods in this great city of Brockton, and I'm a proud Irish American. I represent the connection of Frederick Douglass to Irish Americans and to people who devote their lives to political freedom and elected public service. Frederick Douglass traveled to Ireland and Britain in the 1940s, arriving in Ireland in 1845 at the time of the devastating po potato famine. There he met and was, was inspired by Daniel O'Connell. Mr. O'Connell, born in 1775, fought for the rights of the Irish to serve as members of parliament. O'Connell was famous orator, an affairs debater, and a sharp wit. He was a regular thorn in the side of Dublin authorities. Later in his life, he was elected Lord Mayor of Dublin. He also played a prominent role in anti-slavery movements in Europe and the world. Much like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., later in our history, Mr. O'Connell mobilized a population in Ireland that was previously not engaged in politics, but also one unified voice for the poorest of the poor. In September of 1845, Frederick Douglass, during a two-year lecture of Ireland and England, appeared next to O'Connell at a Dublin rally attended by the more, more than 1,000 people. Douglass later wrote, O'Connell's eloquence came down upon the vast assembly like a summer thunder shower upon a dusty road. While Douglass was in Britain, his English admirers raised money to purchase his freedom. Mr. Douglas was freed after his own Hugh Auld received $711.66 in payment. In 2011, 
President Barack Obama, who has written about the influence of Douglas on his own thinking, commented on the O'Connell-Douglas uh, uh, connection. For his part, Douglas drew inspiration from the Irishman's courage and intelligence, ultimately modeling his own struggle for justice on O'Connell's belief that change could be achieved peacefully through rule of law. The two men shared a universal desire for freedom, one that cannot be contained by language or culture or even the span of an ocean. My name is Adriano Cabral, and I am a mental health counselor, a member of the Brockton Diversity Commission, and a proud Kiverian American. I represent the connection of Frederick Douglass to Cape Verdean Americans. Frederick Douglass was born a slave in 1818, 200 years ago. He escaped from Baltimore, Maryland in 1838. He had worked for several years in the shipyards of Baltimore as a caulker. It is not surprising that he ended up in New Bedford, which in the early 18 was populated by many Cavardians and Azorians who had arrived in whaling ships. Those men in New Bedford may have been some of the first free men of color in such numbers that uh, Douglas had encountered to date. Amilcar Cabral, who was born in 1924, was a fighter for freedom like Mr. Douglas. Mr. Cabral encouraged Cape Verdeans and people of Portuguese uh, Guinea to support the opposition against colonial rule. He helped to organize a liberation movement, which eventually became the African Party for Independence for Guinea in Cape Verde. Recognizing his personal responsibility to his country and the continent, Mr. Cabral once stated that his work in the liberation movement was a way to pay his debt with his people. Amilcar Cabral influenced many of the liberation movements in Africa. He shared his ideas with civil rights workers in the United States. He was awarded honorary degrees for many U.S. universities. Amilcar Cabral was assassinated in 1973 at the young age of 48, but his spirit and courage lived on in the hearts of Kiberdians today. Mr. Douglas lived in New Bedford from 1838 to 1842. At the young age of 23, Douglas spoke out at an anti-slavery meeting in the spring of 1841. While in New Bedford, and was invited to attend the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Convention in Nantucket to speak on August 11, 1841. Amilcar Cabral believed in the dignity and of humankind and the natural rights of all people to progress and develop without barriers. And so did Mr. Douglas, Frederick Douglas. So now I want you to use your imagination and I want you to travel back in time to 1877. Brockton was still North Bridgewater. Brockton was incorporated as a town in 1821 and we were not a city until 1881. Thank you, Willie. So we're still in North Bridgewater. The Civil War was over and President Rutherford Hayes had just appointed Frederick Douglass the United States Marshal of the District of Columbia. Mr. Douglas became the first African American confirmed for a presidential appointment by the United States Senate. Thank you and good evening. If you take nothing else from my presentation this afternoon. I was told to ask if you can see me. I'm supposed to stand at a certain distance back and forth, so let me ask that. Can you see me? Okay. So if you take nothing else from my presentation, please remember this. 
the Republican Party hmm, is the deck. All else merely the open sea. I say this for three reasons. The Emancipation Proclamation, the Union Army, and the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution granting black men the right to vote. And each of these milestones can be embodied in the life, the legacy, the memory of the late President Abraham Lincoln. When the President came to power, as you remember, in 1860, and the war commenced and it ravaged and raised, the president was quite clear about the mission of the war. The mission of this war, said he, is to save the Union. This is not a war to free the slaves. The black man has no place in this war. Well, some of us took issue with that, and we said, with all due respects, Mr. President, unless you free the slaves, there can be no union. First, you must free the slaves, and then you must arm the freedmen. Well, in due course for moral and military necessity, the president came to see the utility of this advice, so he issued a proclamation of emancipation which said in part, as of 1 January 1863, all those that are held in states in rebellion against the Union are henceforth and forever free and one little line in there said that black men would be allowed to do what white men can do in this country to fight for the liberty of their homes, their wives, and their children. I was still living in Rochester, New York during those days, and John Andrew, a friend of mine, was still governor of the Commonwealth, and the state of Massachusetts was granted the privilege of raising the first free black regiment. George Stearns, Major Stearns, was put ahead of that effort and I was brought aboard as one of his many recruiters. And the recruitment effort was quite successful until, well, oh, some things began to happen. I just didn't feel comfortable about it and I was talking to Major Stearns and he said, well, Douglas, if you feel that strongly about it, why don't you just take it up with the president himself? So I thought, well, why not? So I took transportation over to Washington City, and on my way over to the executive office building, I ran into a acquaintance of mine, Samuel Pomeroy, who was one of the senators from the state of Kansas. I told him, he asked if he could accompany me, and if he could indeed introduce me to the president. I said, well, come on. We made our way over. There were many people in the building. I sent up my card. I mean, a person could wait sometime days to see the president, but no sooner than I sat down, I heard the name Frederick Douglass announced. And I began to make my way through the crowd. And as I was moving through, I heard someone say, yep, I know they let the nigger in first. So I got there and the president was sitting and his legs were sprayed throughout the room. It was obviously a well-used room and he looked up, he saw me, he smiled and he began to rise and rise and <coughs> rise and <coughs> all of a sudden the audacity of what I was about to do began to dawn on me. Here I am, an ex-slave, scheduling his own meeting with the president, and I'm afraid I began to babble. <clears throat> I said, uh, uh, pardon me, Mr. President, uh, uh, my name is Frederick Douglass, and I, I, he said, I know who you are, Mr. Douglass. Secretary Seward told me all about you, and he invited me to sit. 
And I said, well, Your Excellency, I don't want to take up too much of their time, but there are two items I would like to discuss with you, uh, pay, protection, and promotion. I said, as you are aware, sir, we have been quite successful in our recruiting effort, but it was with the understanding that Negro soldiers would be paid at the same rate as white soldiers, but such is not the case. President listened very intently, and I said on this matter of protection, if it's true, as has been rumored, that Jefferson Davis intends to either shoot any black soldier that's captured or put them back into slavery, and any white officer commanding black troops would not be treated as a capture of war would be put in hard confinement, well, we think the Union should retaliate in kind. And finally, sir, when our boys distinguish themselves in battle, we feel as though they should be promoted in the same way that white boys are so promoted. The president was very deliberate. He said, well, you know, Mr. Douglas, this, this pay issue is not very popular among whites in the North. And besides, Negro soldiers have a much deeper meaning for fighting, but we feel as though we would get this matter settled. And so far as protection, I've already issued a retaliatory order, and I'm willing to sign off on any promotion the Secretary of War Stanton gives me. Then he waited to see if I had anything else, and I didn't. We were excused. On our way back across the grounds, I began to think about this feeling I had got from the president. And I thought about this, it has something to do with, well, how a black man in this country positions himself relative to a white man and vice versa. That is, at no point in my conversation with the president did I get the idea that he looked upon himself as a superior speaking to an inferior. He simply received me as one gentleman received another. And indeed, I came to understand he is honest Abe, and I went about my recruiting effort. Of course now, President had been on record much earlier speaking about his opposition to slavery. Back in 54, he had talked about how he hated slavery. Of course, now, I hated slavery, too. But I hated it for a little bit different reason than the president. I hated slavery based on my own personal experience. I was born around the year 1817, Eastern Shore, Maryland, Talbot County, Tuckahoe, Lord Plantation. That's Edward Lord one of the richest and most powerful men in the country, former governor, former United States senator, and I was owned by a man named Aaron Anthony. Goes now I have to say that for a slave boy, I really didn't have it too bad. Though I did have to live right around a year under one of Captain Anthony's worst overseers, a man named Edward Covey. Now, Covey, was a mean, mean man. He used to walk around every day with a four-foot rawhide roof, and he'd pop the hide off your back just as soon as look at you. I tell you, there weren't many people in this world that scared me any more than Covey. We used to call him the snake. <laughs> I remember this one particular morning. While I was obeying his orders to feed and get the horses ready for the fields, Covey sneaked into the stable in his peculiar snake-like manner. He seized me by the leg and threw me to the ground, and while down, he seemed to think he had me securely within his power, but little did he realize that he was in for a definite struggle. Now, from whence came the spirit necessary to struggle with a man who 24 hours before could have made me tremble like a leaf in a storm? I don't know, but at any rate, I was determined to fight, and what's more, I was hard at it. I flung him to the ground several times and held him down so 
firmly that his blood followed my nails. I held him and <coughs> he held me. After about 10 minutes, Covey looked up at me and said, Now you going to resist me, you scoundrel? To which I returned very polite, Yes, sir, I am. About this time, Bill, the hired hand, came in and Covey called upon him for assistance. Take hold of him, take hold of him, said Covey. Or uh, indeed, Mr. Covey, uh, I want to do my work. This is your work. Take hold of him. Now, Mr. Covey, my master hired me out here to work and not to help you whip up on Frederick. Bill, don't you put your hands on me. My God, Frederick, I ain't going to touch you. We were all in open rebellion that morning. Finally, about two hours elapsed and Covey gave up the contest. He said, a huffing and a puffing, and his eyes was all aglow. Now, you get on away from here, you scoundrel. One way from here. And I grabbed, I wouldn't have whooped your half as much as I did if you hadn't resisted. Wrong, wrong. Well, during the remaining six months that I lived with Kobe, he never laid so much as the weight of his little finger on me again in anger. All he would occasionally say, I don't want to have to put my hands on you again, a declaration I had no difficulty in believing. Well, this little transaction with Covey, as undignified as it was, was a turning point in my life as a slave. I'd reached a point at which I was not afraid to fight back. And this spirit made me a free man, in fact, though I remained a slave in form. So, at the beginning of the year, 1837, I took upon myself a solemn vow that the year which had now dawned would not close without witnessing an earnest attempt on my part to gain my freedom. An escape, I eventually did. I was one of those fortunate few who managed to obtain a ticket on that special railroad that extended from Kentucky straight on into Canada. So on a cool Monday morning, the 3rd of September, 1838, in accordance with my previous resolution, I jumped on board and exchanged my bondage for my freedom. My intended wife, Anna, a free woman of color, came up from Baltimore into New York City. We were married, then into the town of New Bedford in Massachusetts. Fine city, New Bedford. Whaling capital. One of the richest cities in America. And while wandering around the city of New Bedford for several months there, came to me a young man with a copy of the Liberator, the paper edited by the great abolitionist William Lord Garrison. From the time I was brought in contact with the mind of Garrison, his paper took its place with me next to the Bible. It exposed wickedness and hypocrisy in high places, made no truth with the traffickers in the bodies and souls of men, but this paper preached human brotherhood, denounced oppression, and with all the solemnity of God's own words, demanded the complete and unconditional emancipation of my people. I not only liked this paper, I loved it, along with its editor. So, you can imagine my excitement when in 1841, August, I was invited to give a little speech out on the island of Nantucket, and I began to tell my story. Mr. Garrison, Mr. Phillips, and others invited me to be a part of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and I became a paid agent. Took my place as a speaker on the cause of liberty. Of course, now, as the war continued, though, <clears throat> well, northern politicians and people had misjudged the tenacity of the southern forces. 
they thought it would be over in a matter of months, if not weeks. I uh, did not think so. They began to wonder as the war drove on, what would happen if certain powers of Europe, our traditional ally of France, or when those, those textile mills up in the northern part of England began to close because of the naval blockade. Would the British uh, uh, break through that blockade and join the war effort? And if they did, would they intervene on the part of the North or their natural economic trading powers, the power of the South? Well, President worried about this. I didn't worry about it because as on the issue of slavery, I had a bit of personal relationship with the English people that the president didn't have. Because in August of 45, I published my first book, the narrative of my life, and I set sail to take my message to Europe. Little realizing how truly successful and enjoyable that trip would be. Because for the first time in my life, I knew the feeling of what it meant to be free. I mean truly free. From the moment I stepped on British soil, the instant I landed at the dock at Liverpool, I beheld a people as white as any as I had ever seen in the United States. But instead of meeting the curled lip of scorn, all I beheld was kindness. And I traveled in all parts of the country, in England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. <laughs> I journeyed up on the steamboats, the railways, and in not one various conveyance on any class of society did I meet any curl lip of scorn. Why, even the very dogs of old England know that I'm a man. I was uh, attending a meeting at Buckingham. And while up on the platform, a little dog actually came up there and put his paw right smack dab in the middle of it and gave me a bark Alf! of recognition as a man. And I figured in these days of doubt, even a dog's testimony was worth something. So you can imagine my excitement and the depth of my gratitude as I addressed the British public at the London Tavern that April of 47 upon my departure. I, uh, I do not return to America to sit still, to remain quiet and to enjoy a life of ease and comfort. Since I have been in this country, I have been offered house, land, and every inducement to bring my family over here but good and dear people. I prefer living a life of activity in the service of my brethren. I choose rather to go home, to return to America, I glory in the conflict that I might hereafter exalt in the victory, and I know that victory is certain. So I go turning my back upon the ease, the comfort, the respectability that I might maintain here, ignorant as I am, still I go back for the sake of my brethren. I go to suffer with them, to endure insult with them, to lift up my voice in their behalf and to speak and write in their vindication for that emancipation which shall yet be achieved by the power of truth and of reason. So with these words, I beg to bid all of my friends, those who are here and those who have departed, farewell. And upon my return to the land of liberty. It was business as usual. And many of the words that I had spoken while abroad, biting scornful words about this racialist American society came back to bite me. 
And I make no pretension here. They came from all directions, from friends and foe alike, from black as well as white, from people who believe that a man, and especially a black man, presumes too much when he decides to take the plight of black people before other nations of the world. How dare a black man take it upon himself to experiment in the area of international politics? Well, Frederick, I understand that boy, but what good has it done? Have you not irritated? Have you not annoyed your American friends? Have I not irritated? <laughs> I don't believe this. Have I not irritated? Yes, James, I have irritated them. They deserve to be irritated. I am ever anxious to irritate the American people on this question, that James, and as it is in physics, so in morals. There are cases which demand irritation and counter irritation. And I grabs, I intend to blister it all over from center to circumference. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. My name is Frederick Douglass. What? that you say? America, love it or be gone. And we display a grand amount of ingratitude. Like a man who goes into a gentleman's house, accepts his hospitality, and yet abuses his fare, and we have no right to abuse a country under whose government we are safely residing and securely protected. So, I see, here we have it, all reasoned out as plain as logic can make it the limit of freedom of speech accurately defined. But allow me to throw a little light upon your logic, sir. Well, a gentleman's house and hospitality and the government of this country are wholly dissimilar. Let me suggest, therefore, to you that a restaurant bears a far greater resemblance to the government of this country than a gentleman's house and hospitality. So if you will allow the restaurant to represent the country, the bill of fare or menu, the bill of rights, and the chief cook, the commander in chief. Now, enter a black man. He goes into your restaurant. He reads your bill of fare. It contains the names of many palatable dishes. So he asks the cook for soup, and he gets dishwater. For a duck, he gets dog. For beef, he gets bullfrog. For salt, sand, pepper, powder, and for vinegar, he gets <coughs> gall. In fact, he gets for you the very opposite of everything you ask and from which the bill of fare you had a right to expect. So I can read with pleasure, sir, your constitution to establish the blessings of liberty and prosperity. Those are indeed precious sayings to your mind. But when I remember that an aged grandmother who's reared 12 children for the southern market. When I remember that when she became too much racked with pain, she was turned out by a professed Christian master literally to die with none to look after her and the institutions of this country, church and state, sanctioning and sanctifying this crime, I have no words of eulogy. I have no patriotism. How can I love a country when the blood of my blood, the flesh of my flesh, is making fat the soil of America? America's soil is stained red with the blood of black women shrinking flesh. No, I make no pretension to patriotism. So long as my voice can be heard on this or the other side of the Atlantic, I will hold up this country to the righteous indignation of moral scorn. And in so doing, 
I will feel myself discharging the true duty of a patriot. Well, as it is with the parent to the child, so with the citizen to the country. For he is a true lover of his native land who rebukes and does not excuse its crimes. And on this matter, sir, I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat one single inch and I will be heard. So I understood that once the British understood what this war was about, that this was no war of attrition, this was no war of northern aggression, but this was a war to bring about and make real the principles of American democracy, the British people and the French people would understand and do the right thing, and indeed that would happen. Now, Parts of my life also began to change personally. I began to have certain issues with the Massachusetts Abolitionist Society and certain personal and political issues with Mr. Garrison. I remember this one particular afternoon, I was entertaining uh, some fellow and a sister member of the society and I was in conversation and just responded to a question from a British journalist, and he asked me about education. Oh, book learning. Well, as a newspaper editor myself, Mr. Foster, I certainly am aware of the immense value of a broad academic background. But education of the head should not be the only concern of the Negro educator. What else? Well, education of the heart, of course, because it will take heart more so than head to pull us through the difficult days we have before us. From which institution did I receive my education? Well, my primary years were spent in the institution of slavery, and I went on to Abolition University, William Lord Garrison, president, dedicated to him. <laughs> oh, I owe him everything, everything. Yes, dear. Yes, indeed. Send him in. Well, he's here, folks. And I do hope this goes well. Now, Henry does tend to be a bit extreme in his approach to things, but he's a sincere man, so go easy on him and Wendell. Wendell, Wendell, Wendell. Now, Wendell, if you feel yourself getting a little heated under the collar, that rear door there will give you a good cooling off place. I understand that, Wendell, but you know how emotional you tend to be sometimes. Henry! <laughs> Welcome. Good, good. Come on in. So nice to see you. Uh, gentlemen and lady, this is, of course, the Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, pastor of the Liberty Street Presbyterian Church, brother and fellow abolitionist. Oh, abolition is non-affiliate, not to be confused with the Garrisonian wing of the movement. Is that sufficient, Reverend? Good, good. This, of course, is John Collins and Wendell Phillips, uh, both of whom you know already. Mr. Reginald Foster, a columnist from the London Times, and finally, my house guest, trusted advisor, dear friend, Julia Griffith, also of London. So, if everyone would just make themselves comfortable, I'll serve tea. <coughs> Certainly did enjoy your speech of last evening, Henry. Fiery though it was. No, no, no. That's not a cut. You know me. I'm not one to spare the razor's edge myself. It's just that we had a bit of a problem with the tone of your oratory and with the content, <coughs> uh, some of the content as well. For instance, well, here, where you wrote, Brethren, arise. Strike 
for your lives and liberty. Let every slave throughout the land do this, and the days of slavery are numbered. Remember, we cannot be more oppressed than we have been. We cannot suffer greater anguish in our lives than we have already. Rather, die free men than live to be slaves. <laughs> well, Henry, it would appear as though you were advocating, God forbid, open rebellion by slaves. Well, yes, quite frankly, there is something wrong with that. And I'm not about to advocate anything that could lead to the wholesale slaughter. Yes, the wholesale slaughter of my people. I understand that they are your people too, Henry, but look. Now, you see what they are doing to the red man in this country. Now, what do you think they would do to us if we certainly decided, Mr. Garrison, what well, Mr. Garrison concurs wholeheartedly, but that has nothing to do with what I'm saying. Look, Henry, well, I resent your implication, sir. A white man's nigger? Oh, Wendell, you reason with him. Henry Highland Garnett, one of an increasing number of militant abolitionists growing up in opposition to those of us who still preferred reason instead of force. But despite my original misgivings about his rhetoric, I later realized that his words had begun to penetrate a portion of my mind that I had almost forgotten existed. Trouble for some months over this issue until late one night, I addressed a letter to a dear and trusted friend. I close with the following. And the more I consider our present condition in America, the more I realize that for us, she has neither justice, mercy, nor religion. We have no resting place abroad nor protection at home but we are outcasts from the land of our society and sojourners as all our fathers were. So despite my original misgivings about their rhetoric, I now find myself moving closer to the views of the younger members of the movement. I'm not at this time willing to advocate an open rebellion by slaves, but I do have extreme misgivings about Garrison's insistence on moral suasion alone. It is most definitely a key ingredient, but should it remain the only ingredient? However, I am ever willing to be known as a Garrisonian abolitionist for all times. Sincerely, Frederick please give careful considerations over these issues as I'm greatly troubled about this stance. Oh, Julia, I wonder if you could hand me an envelope. There should be some on... <laughs> Thank you. You know, sometimes I really don't know what I would do without you, but You've got to stop reading my thoughts. At least wait until I've got them organized myself. Not just yet. You go on. I'll see you in the morning. The last straw occurred in 1850 with the passage of the newly strengthened Federal Fugitive Slave Bill. This was the bill that made slavery not a n northern, or not a southern, not a midwestern, but a national institution. I was inside my printing office when one of my co-workers brought me the news. What? Oh my gosh. Julia! Julia! Come out here a moment, please. Listen to this. Listen to this. <coughs> Special federal commissioners shall be appointed to aid in the apprehension of runaway slaves. 
They shall have the power to compel all United States Marshals and their deputies to aid in the search. Furthermore, all private citizens are subject to the carrying out of this statute. The decision of the commissioners as to the status of the Negro is final. Only white people are determined or able to be commissioners. Well, I called a special meetings in town hall that night and I made the statement. Quiet! Quiet! Can I have your attention, please? Now, we all know the state of the matter. We are all aware that since the passage of this mockery of a law, none of us, I repeat, none of us are safe from any slime from any scum of the earth who wishes to put us in chain. I received the news just this evening that hundreds, perhaps thousands of our brothers and sisters are fleeing across the border into Canada. Well, let me go on record this day by saying the only way to make this fugitive slave law a dead letter is to make half a dozen or more dead kidnappers. The man who takes the office of a bloodhound ought to be treated as a bloodhound. Yes, sir. What would I do? Well, I'll tell you, sir. If any slave hunter, if any slimy, pale, yellow, southern running dog who walks around on two legs comes around my home, my wife, and my family, he'd better first take care of two things. Make out his will and make peace with his maker. Yes, sir. A few days later, when a calmer, cooler side of my personality emerged, I made the following announcement to a Boston audience. I have little hope now in the freedom of the slaves by peaceful means. A long history of peaceful slave holdings have placed the slave holders beyond the reach of moral or humane considerations. They have neither ears nor hearts for the appeals of justice. So long as a slave will tamely submit his neck to the yoke, his back to the lash, and his anchor to the fetter and chain, the Bible will be continuously quoted and learning invoked to justify the evils of slavery. And I would welcome the intelligence tomorrow should it come that the slaves have arisen and that the sable arm which has been engaged in adorning and beautifying the South is now engaged in spreading death and devastation. Well, as might have been expected, Garrison was outraged. He cried out, there's roguery somewhere, and then sent out the general order that my newspaper, the North Star, be stricken from the list of approved readings. I was besieged by reporters awaiting my response. Yes, gentlemen. Well, even though I do consider his remarks to be hurting and insulting. I can easily forgive this man for whom I still cherish a veneration only inferior in degree to that of my conscience and my God. Several weeks later, Julia came into my office with the latest issue of the Liberator, very upset at his latest headlines. Well, I don't know if it's as bad as all of that or not. That's, hmm. Hmm. Douglas has ostracized himself. He has lost much of his moral power and will lose what little remains if he persists in his present course of action. And there are rumors about that a certain female observer in his printing office 
has not only biased his own judgment, but has caused considerable unhappiness in his own home? Who? Oh, the free press and curiosity seekers. Well, bring them in, Dave. No, wait. I'll go out. Julia, you. Yes, gentlemen. No, no. I have no comment about his attempted slander. But there is one passage that I will comment on, and that is where he writes, the anti-slavery cause, both religiously and philosophically, has now transcended the ability of the Negroes as a class to understand its operations and to perceive the depth of its philosophy. Well, I will only say that the colored people ought to feel profoundly grateful for this compliment to their high moral worth and breadth of comprehension so generously bestowed upon them by Mr. William Lloyd Garrison. And one other statement where he writes that Douglas is only interested in his own selfish self-interest. Well, I stand on my record with one reply. If it is true that I am only interested in my own selfish self-interest, as he puts it, then don't you know that it would have been infinitely easier for me to remain as a lecturer with the Garrisonians than to move into a new neighborhood and to open up my own business as a newspaper publisher but you see, I happen to believe that one of the most important contributions that I can make to the Negro people is to demonstrate that we, us, ourselves, have got to be the most active actors in the struggle and not merely understudies while whites are cast in lead roles outlining the battle for us. That would be childish indeed. And they display the greatest amount of naivete who believe that once we have seen the stage, once we have heard the roar of the crowd, we will patiently wait in the wings for the roar to subside before taking our interest. No, sir, indeed not. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I acted as a child. But when I became a man, I put away my childish thing. So if that's all, gentlemen, good day. So this began my movement from being a Garrisonian, a moral suasionist, into a radical political abolitionist. Because you see, Mr. Garrison had three major tenets. One is that he felt the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Therefore, one should not be engaged in organized voting politics. Two, he felt that the church was a pro-slavery institution. And three, he thought that moral suasion, not physical force, should be used to organize the battle. Well, I disagree with that. When we moved to Rochester, began to interact with other people like Mr. Jared Smith and others, and gradually split, and it was for that way how I was able to become a political abolitionist and engage in a political conversation with the president. So almost one year later, the war is raging. The president himself called me to see him. I walked into his office. I found him in a greatly agitated state. He said to me, Douglas, the slaves are not escaping behind Union army lines as much as we had anticipated. I said to him, Mr. President, of course not. In fact, most slaves have never heard of your proclamation of emancipation. He said, yes, and that's where you come in. And then he began to outline this plan that he wanted me to enact. And as he began to think about it, you know, there are times when your mind began to go this way and this way, and it began to be cloudy. And I began to realize that the president, the commander in chief, was ordering me, was giving me advice, was requesting that I do the very thing that my friend John Brown had been hanged for doing. And I thought back that last time I saw John Brown's in Pennsylvania. She was green and I had come up and I seen him out there and we began to talk and I said to him, no, 
No, no. I like the idea of running slaves into the mountains, Captain Brown. You're properly executed, just might work. Especially with your keen awareness that a squad of slaves could indeed hold off an army once they had secured their stronghold, but I must take issue with your initial step, John. I don't believe that Harper's Ferry should serve as the beginning point. Of course, it would dramatize the evils of slavery, strike terror in the slaveholders, and arouse the attention of the nation. But look, John, you can't possibly believe that a small band of ill-armed, ill-equipped slaves are truly a match for the United States government even with such an able commander as yourself. I plead with you, John, call it off. Well, I must say the twos to those who can use them. Good luck, Captain Brown, and Godspeed. A most committed gentleman, John Brown, while in color, a white man, yet in sympathy a black, and is deeply committed to our struggle as though his own soul had been pierced with the hot iron of slavery. Well, I put together that plan, but fortunately, many months earlier, the president had chosen a real field commander, Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses had gone down, he had captured Vicksburg, he had split Southern forces, and then his second in command, Sherman and Sheridan, had marched to the sea, and at that point, Lee sued for peace. Appomattox happened, the president was reelected. I was determined to hear, because I was disappointed with his first inaugural, but I wanted to hear that second. So we are in a friend of mine, later friend, we are in the large crowd there, and President is up on the platform, standing next to his new uh, vice president, uh, Andrew Johnson. You know, there are times when you can find yourself reaching and seeing the heart of a person. Well, I'm standing there, and the president notices me in the crowd, and he points me out to Vice President Johnson. And then the vice president looks, and he sees who the president is talking about. The scowl comes over his face. Then when he noticed that I'm looking, the scowl becomes a smile, but too late. I saw what's in. And I said to my friend, I do not know who this Andrew Johnson is, but he is no friend of our people. Well, normally no black people are allowed to enter the recession, but we decided we would break with tradition. And we walked up there, and a couple of policemen wouldn't let us in. Finally, we got in. The, we were walking through, and the president, standing head and shoulders above all else, he looked up, and he smiled, and I came to him, and he said quite loud, Ah, here comes my friend, Frederick Douglass. And I walked up, he said, I noticed you in the crowd this afternoon. Uh, what did you think about my speech? I said, Oh, Mr. President, you have thousands of people wanting to shake your hand. You don't have time to hear my critique of your speech. He said, No, no. There's no opinion that I value more than my friend, Frederick Douglass. What did you think about my speech? I said it was a sacred effort, Mr. President, a sacred effort. He said, well, I'm glad you liked it. And I went on. A week or so later, I got an invitation from the president to join him for tea at the soldier's home. This was an establishment a few miles outside of Washington City. The president would go and collect his thoughts. I had a speech that I was committed to that day, and I've always made it a habit never to cancel a speech. But so many times thereafter, I wish I had disappointed that audience and kept that tea with the president. Three or four weeks after his funeral, I was a package in my place and a nice note from Mrs. Lincoln. And I opened it and she said, the president considered you to be not only a political ally, but a personal friend. And I'm sure he would want you to have something personal to remember him by. And she gave me his favorite walking cane and it still sits in my office. 
So as I come to a conclusion, I guess this, you can get an idea of why I began this conversation by saying the Republican Party is the deck. All else, the oceans, ocean, ocean, deadly sea. I say it for three reasons. The Emancipation Proclamation, the Union Army, and the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution granting black men the right to vote. And each of these milestones can be embodied in the life, the legacy, the memory of the late great president, Abraham Lincoln. Hi there. Oh, you come to give Grandpa a good night hug before going to bed, huh? Do you have to? Well, I don't know. Which one? Go to bed or give Gramps a good night hug? Oh, you don't mind about the hugging part. <laughs> well, I tell you what. Come on over here. Why don't we take a little walk around the yard before going in? You like that? I thought you would. All right. All right, now, we're not going to be out here long, because <laughs> I know you, you'll walk me to death. Okay. <laughs> you know, baby, it was on a night, just about like the night that your gramps decided he was going to make his escape. What type was it? Well, baby, I was just about the best type of slave there is, a bad one. Every time I had a chance to play crazy instead of smart, I did it, and the more old master hated it, the more Gramps loved it. That's because your grandpa was a young liberator, like you. And what is it that I've always taught you? That our lives, our very existence is a struggle. And if we have no struggle, we have no what? No progress. That's right. Loss? No. As long as you had that old drinking gourd up there, wasn't no way you could get lost. Drinking gourd? You mean to tell me you don't know what the <coughs> what in the world they teaching you in school? Come on over here. Now, you see that group of stars over there? Mm-hmm. Now. See that group right down there that is shaped like a mama's old dipper? Well, that's the little dipper, the old drinking gourd herself. And see that gray big old bright star right there in the tail? That's the North Star, Freedom Star, point due north. As long as you had that up there, there was no way you could get lost. Scared? Well, yeah, baby. Your gramps was scared just about every day of his life down there. But you see, he had some in him. They couldn't scare out of him. Well, that was a longing. Longing for the truth. <coughs> and the truth of the matter is, young lady, that you have to go to bed, <coughs> and so do I. Yeah, I understand that. But, coming over here, I got a speech, I got to tomorrow, and I got to get some sleep. All right. Well, yeah. Yeah, you can be there. In fact, I want you to be there. I want you to be there. I want your brothers to be there, too. All of it. So you can hear it. The truth about our people. Ugly as it is. Well, yeah, darling, there, there is beauty in the truth. But the truth is not always beautiful. All right, come on. What? <laughs> All right, come on. All right. Now, what we going to do? God bless Mommy. God bless Daddy. Of course, baby. God bless Father Abraham, too. And I love you, too. You just gramps little old brown sugar. Yes, you are.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. What is your relationship with Harry Beecher Stowe to comment on uh, Uncle Tom's cabin? The question is, what is my relationship with Harriet Beecher Stowe and my comment on, on uh, Uncle Tom's cabin? Oh, I'm a great admirer of Mrs. Stowe. In fact, Mrs. Stowe once told me that she had a certain uh, endowment and where would I want her to place that money? And I thought about the greatest need of our people is for education, uh, mechanics, uh, training. Uh, personally, at this point, I'm a member of the Board of Trustees at Howard University, but in those days, mechanics training as well as liberal arts. Well, that didn't happen, but what Mrs. Doe did in terms of a book, in terms of a novel, she reached masses of people that even my biography, my history was not able to reach. I reached a number of people, but she reached people that I could not reach. So she was able to counter the propaganda that the Southern aristocracy talked about in terms of the good deed that slavery was doing, was br br uh, raising uh, uh, folks up from a primitive status. Back in 52, I was able to give an address to the graduating class of Case Waston University. Uh, the, the, the faculty didn't like that, but the students invited me. And I gave a talk called On the Claims of a Negro Ethnologically Considered. And I talked about how the propagandists that's masquerading as science and how they group the human family. They talk about three stages. There's the lower stage, which is savagery, the middle stage, which they call barbarians, and the upper stage, which they call civilized folks. And then they had three of those stages. That was lower, middle, upper savagery, lower, middle, upper barbarism, and lower, middle, upper civilization. And the most civilized of the civilized were Anglo-Saxon Protestant members of the Church of England. And that's how they did. So therefore, you could be white and civilized, but if you were Catholic and Irish, you were somewhat below the English in terms of their categorization of people. Well, this is how they categorize people. Well, we said we need true education, and that when a person can prove themselves in terms of their creative ability that we thought mechanical training would do, that would be in the best interest of the people. So that was partially my relationship with Ms. Stowe. Other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll, repeat your, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat your question. Yes, sir. It wouldn't destroy the economy of the South. All you got to do is pay people what they're worth. You know, I mean, slavery doesn't exist uh, in the North anymore, but we uh, have a much uh, better economy in the North than they had in the South. That was one of the things I noticed when I left Baltimore and came to New Bedford. When I came to New Bedford, I figured I would see just acres of poverty because they didn't have slave labor. But, and, and that's what we were taught. But when I came to New Bedford and I began to move around the north, I saw high civilization. But the reason they had high civilization, people were paid for their labor. So in the south, that's all you got to do is pay people for their labor, and they will labor for money. I mean, they've been laboring for several hundred years for free. They would labor for money. It would not destroy the southern economy at all. It just wouldn't be slave labor. It would be free labor. Other question? Yes. I, the question is, uh, did I know where I came from? Well, as I said, I was born on the eastern shore of Maryland, Tuckahoe, Talbot County. So I knew that. I knew as far back as my maternal grandmother my mother, uh, Betsy Bailey, my grandmother, Harriet Bailey, had been a part of the Lord Plantation for generations. I could not go back further than that. So I knew myself to be an Eastern Shoreman, and that's who I see myself as. 
Yes. Oh, indeed, I do know Harriet Tutman quite well. Harriet Tutman is also an Eastern Shore woman. And uh, she, you know, when Harriet wrote her book, when it was written for her, she asked me to say some words about it. And she was all complimentary. And I, I said to her, no, 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 Harriet. You know, everything that I've done, I've done it in the day and the light. And the whole world knows about me. But what you have done, for the most part, only the midnight skies and the stars know about your deed. You are a much greater general than I am. I mean, you know, Harriet was with the Massachusetts 54. She was with Robert Gould Shaw and my uh, 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 oldest boy at Fort Wagner. She truly was a general. Now, Secretary Stanton told me that he would give me an appointment. That never did happen, so I never enlisted. My middle son, Frederick Jr., was down in the Mississippi Valley with him recruiting. But my other two boys, Lewis Henry and Charles, were members. But Harriet was right there in the thick of the battle with the rest of the soldiers. Indeed, I know my Eastern Shore woman, Sister Harriet Tudman. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm sorry. You know, I've been wanting to go to Haiti uh, ever since I heard about uh, their first black president, Toussaint Louverture. And I heard the lecture that Wendell Phillips gave on this man. And we always celebrated at Haitian Independence Day as like an independence for us. Just prior to the war, I thought that I would go and visit there but I've not been able to go at this point, and I would hope to go uh, one day in the future because we look upon the Haitian people as the true revolutionaries. You know, Toussaint L'Overture uh, 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 beat the Spanish army and they beat the, the French army as well on two fronts. This was a man who was a true general. You should read Phillips' lecture on Toussaint L'Overture, where he compares him to uh, a, a Cromwell in England, and he also compares him to that Frenchman who had that Waterloo thing that he meet. You know, this was a man that was a true general. But I've not been to Haiti as, as of this point. Thank you, sir, very kindly. And we hope if you have time to join us in the foyer for refreshments. I'm sure people have personal questions that they'd like to ask you as well. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you again to our wonderful sponsors for making this evening possible. And please join us in the foyer for a little touch of sweetness before Mr. Douglas heads back and out um, of North Bridgewater. Thank you kindly. Just want to say, uh, Mr. Douglas is back on the bookshelf, uh, Charles Pace here, to that question, just to clarify, it's set in 1877, so Douglas has not gone to Haiti as the American Consul General at that point. But uh, how, what he thought of Haiti, I mean, he was a great uh, supporter of Haiti. In fact, he was such a great supporter that he had to resign because he was accused of taking the sides of, of, of the Haitian folks as opposed to the America when they tried to co-opt a part of Haitian soil to be used as a military base. In 1893, uh, at the uh, World's Columbian uh, Exposition, the Chicago World's Fair, the Haitian government appointed Douglas to be the head of the Haitian pavilion. So he had a very close relationship, even toward the end of his life, to Haiti and the Haitian people. Thank you. Thank you, sir.